Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. This podcast is a production of the online journal Law and Liberty and hosted by our staff. Please visit us at lawliberty.org and thank you for listening. Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. My name is Helen Dale and I'm senior writer at Law and Liberty. With me today is Douglas Murray, associate editor of The Spectator and author of seven books, including The Strange Death of Europe, The Madness of Crowds, and the subject of part of today's interview, The War on the West. Thank you for joining me, Douglas. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Helen. Without wanting to pin the conversation down the way an entomologist pins insects in a display case, (laughs) the following questions came to mind when I was reading The War on the West and also covering the UK National Conservatism Conference for the Australian and for other outlets at which you spoke. While reading the first third of the book, broadly speaking, the race and history sections, I became increasingly alarmed by what seemed to me to be genuine anti-white racism. And by way of throat clearing, let me note that I'm really quite reluctant to use that phrase. However, and I'm afraid this did involve taking photographs of pages and sending them to an academic friend who specialises in the relationship between ideology and genocide, the material you cite, much of it is nothing short of monstrous. My friend argued that if you draw attention to racial distinctions and then assemble them in a moral hierarchy, you have racism. We then went on to discuss how other classic genocidal tropes include depicting people as vermin, parasites or disease. And I have to say, I think it's fair to say that you've unearthed plenty of that in the first part of the war on the West. Both my academic friend and I are familiar with the film you discuss, Single White Men. At the time it came out, we both thought it tended to fall into the same category as Jewish comedians telling Jewish jokes or Chris Rock's routines taking aim at aspects of African-American culture that would be off limits to others. It's possible too that Karl Marx can be excused some of his comments about Jews because he was himself Jewish. However, the great bulk of the anti-white material you discuss is not funny, or attempting to be funny, and often it's also directed at whites by non-whites. How serious is this anti-white racism? And, depending on your answer to that first question, what is a reasonable public response? I think it's very serious. It's the only permissible racism in our day. There is, as I try to show in the opening chapters of The War on the West, There is almost nothing that you cannot say about white people as white people, up to and including saying that the world would be better off without white people and that something should be done about that. By contrast, almost every other form of racism against any group of people is understandably and legitimately regarded as being effectively reputation-ending, if not career-ending. You, you, know, you can't go about saying things about people who are black if you're not black. And by the way, the example you give of, as it were, a black comedian saying things about black people, Dave Chappelle and so on, it, even that is, is effectively innocent fun. Mm. Michael Moore, who you mentioned, I cited as an example of you know this going back some way, the sort of anti-white racism, by contrast, says things like every problem in the world look at it, and behind it you've got white men. Mm. He, he Just every single problem in the world, every genocide, every war, every battle, every, every ugliness is all to do with white people. Obviously, as I mentioned in the book, Michael Moore is one of those who doesn't realize that other people have agency and can muck up the world and their own countries in their own ways. And um, he's obviously never heard of numerous countries, including North Korea. Well, there's a part of me that wants to say that Genghis Khan is on the line and would like a word. Yes, exactly. But so, so, so there is something different about this in the tone, in the claims being made, and the simple way in which it, it's, it's waved through. I mean, you know, no uh, universities are somewhat over-cited in these, um, in these arguments, perhaps, but they do matter. And I can use it as an example. I mean, if somebody stands up at a university and says that, you know, Jews are responsible for all the problems in the world or black people are responsible for all the problems in the world, they wouldn't be invited back. (laughs) 
They certainly wouldn't be a, me- a member of faculty. By contrast, as I give the example of numerous academics who, who say this about white people, are often not being white themselves and drawing the most negative possible conclusions. And in, in at least one case, as far as I can see, calling explicitly for violence. I think the problem with this is that it's grown up under our noses and it's the result of a couple of things. One is something I'm fond of using as an analogy, but simple overcorrection. You know, there was undoubtedly racism in the past. There certainly is racism. Racism exists. It's it's one of the ugliest traits of the human species, effectively in-out group dynamics. It's almost certainly ineradicable, but it's it's certainly uh, also able to be diminished. It's been, it's able to be made societally unacceptable. And because there was acceptable racism in the past in countries like Australia, Britain, and America, there seems to be some sort of overcorrection which says, well, because there was racism against these groups in the past, we can m- make up for it by being racist against the, the, the people who were thought of as being the racist people. I found that description of the of the US. I, was it a was he a four star general? I can't remember. Mm. Yeah, he'd not heard it before. You had, and I had had yes. heard this before. And then he was just sitting there because this was a number of years ago. It was two thousand and eleven mm. or something. Yeah, around then. Yeah, he said to me as as, as somebody said to us on stage, it's just two white men speaking. I, I'd heard that kind of rhetoric before. Um, but the general who was on my side, American general, had not. And from his point of view, it was, it was very shocking. I, uh, I, I was like immune to it already. But, I mean, I think his point of view was, but <laughs> I'm a four-star general. I've been in charge of operations in Afghanistan, risked my life for years and worked in the military for years and been everywhere around the world. And, and Douglas Murray sitting beside me is younger and has had totally different experiences and has done very different things. So how do we become just the same person in yes. the eyes of this other speaker, other than if you want to pretend that you can sum up everything about a person in their in their race? And and that is racism. I mean it's 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 a minor example of it. But you know, again, if 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 somebody was to be on stage and just say, oh, that's just two brown people talking, you know. It's the moralised hierarchy that my academic friend was saying. That, he said, is what's particularly dangerous. Lots of societies, yes. he was saying, have noticed that people look different and they have different char- different temperaments and characteristics. Yes. The Greeks and Romans, who didn't attach much importance to colour, um, noticed mm. this. But they'd never put it into a moralised hierarchy, and that's the danger. Yes. And there's several different aspects to that, of course, one is the people who you put at the bottom of the hierarchy effectively now, which is, say, white people who, about whom you can say anything. But the inverse of that is the interesting phenomenon of attributing special characteristics that are benevolent or, 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 or blessed to um, certain other groups. Uh, my friend Coleman Hughes, distinguished a black American writer, a distinguished American writer who happens to be black, uh, in one of his first essays uh, mentioned the fact that at university in America in recent years, you know, some of his contemporaries who were white treated him as though there was something special he knew or some wisdom he especially had by dint of his racial characteristics. Well, th- that's also a form of racism. It's the inversion of the magic, magical Negro trope. Yes. yes. It's as if you were saying, in the past we attributed negative characteristics to this group. Now we will, we will attribute um, positive characteristics to this group. Neither is particularly desirable, it seems. How do reasonable people, both commentators like you and I, and ordinary members of the public, fight back? I mean, if it is th- this serious, because it's dreadful rhetoric, how do we fight back? Well, I think people just have to call it out whenever they see it, which is how racism of all kinds has been diminished in the past. I mean, it's it you make it societally unacceptable. You know, I mean, I mean, how was racism, uh, you know, directed towards other groups diminished in the past? You know, by by law to some extent, but more significantly by uh, societal. Um, approbation and, and and much else about people speaking in in particular ways i i think that let's say you know if somebody said something that was racist about somebody of a different of a non-white skin color near you you might 
call it out. And you might also more likely, you would never want to be near that person again or in their orbit. I would simply suggest it would be the same with this. You just, people shouldn't wish to be around people who like demeaning people by their racial background, whatever that background is. But I think that it requires a slight change of perspective, or a slight change of emphasis at the institutional levels in our countries, which is that this is not acceptable. It's mm-hmm. not an acceptable way to talk. And that when you have a sort of race-baiting academic, like one particular person who I won't name at Cambridge University. Who- oh, I'm well aware of, of um, who you're talking about because this particular individual teaches at the college where my partner went. And it right. is a source of irritation in this household and it is why yes. my partner's donations to her old college have dried up. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that. I mean, that's the sort of thing, and I hope she said that that was why. Um, yes. Because it, it, it is very important that if you have an academic in a position of um, authority and of influence over young people, that that person is not allowed to pollute the public square by making race-baiting accusations against all white people any more than it would be if, if that person used their platform to say nasty things about black people. I would I would throw one other thing into the mix if I can, Helen, which is the sure. oddity in our day of a certain type of person we would have called public intellectual in the past who doesn't deserve that term today but who, because they don't defend their ideas, but who throw out highly incendiary ideas about race and then will not defend them. I'm thinking specifically of people like the white <laughs> author of White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo. She does not put herself forward for debate or discussion or interview. Yeah. And she throws out extraordinarily incendiary claims, like the claim that Americans, in, um, white Americans enjoy seeing black bodies being punished. And that's just a mess of Foucault in there as well. As soon as you see that bodies word, that's just yeah. a giveaway, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, when somebody like her, and I would add in somebody like Ibram X. Kendi, author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, he throws in extraordinarily nasty uh, generalizations and, and just will not defend them in public, says, I refuse to give a platform to anyone who criticizes me. As I say, it, it has been the norm in our societies that people defend their ideas, particularly if inflammatory ideas, in public. We have to find a term for this type of person in our day who throws out uh, unprovable or rather provable lies, uh, but who will not defend them in public and just sort of runs away from contest. Conversational coward comes to mind, but I don't know whether yeah. that's particularly adequate. Your section on reparations and discussion of ta Coates' desire to emulate the post-war reparations Germany paid to Israel actually sent me down a reparations rabbit hole. Mm. I discovered there have been enormous and ongoing difficulties in Israel administering reparation monies and also widespread corruption. When the original Konrad Adenauer-David Ben-Gurion agreement was entered into in 1952, There were riots outside the Knesset, an extremist attempted to bomb Israel's foreign ministry building, and a parcel bomb was sent to Adenauer, killing one of his police bodyguards. The spark for those riots and for the riots and for the terrorism was the argument that, as when damages or other remedies have been awarded at trial, a line must then be drawn under the dispute. Lawyers actually have a technical term for this, it comes from Roman law. It's res judicata. Literally, the thing is decided. Now, Ben-Gurion considered that res judicata was necessary for Israel to, to move forward and to move on. But about half the country disagreed with him and still does. Relatedly, the Claims Conference, which is one of a number of organisations, both within Israel and outside it, administering reparations, has been plagued with corruption and maladministration. A distinguished Jewish Australian, the late Izzy Liebler, pointed out that the organisation's bigwigs were earning vast salaries, while actual known Holocaust survivors around the world were being paid less than the Israeli state pension. In 2013, the conference's funds director was jailed for eight years for his part in a US dollar 57 million fraud. (laughs) 
this is the only reparations regime on foot anywhere in the world. And we all know what happened with the reparations regime flowing from the Treaty of Versailles, of course. Hmm. How does one go about getting it across to people just how difficult and morally complicated this is, even when the history is relatively recent and claimants can be identified? And as a follow-up to that, are there good silver bullet arguments against reparations given the German-Israeli experience? How useful are legal concepts, statutes of limitation or raised judicata here? Yes, it's a very interesting and deep area, this, which one of the reasons why I wanted to address the reparations argument is because it's been treated so lightly in recent years, particularly in America. Uh, the example of uh, the Ben Gurion Adana uh, agreement is a pertinent one, and uh, of course, as I say, I mean, it happened within a few years mm. uh, of the Holocaust, and th- th- there's, there's there's deep moral and other arguments to be had about about that agreement, but if in the case of reparations to the descendants of slaves, anyone thinks that reparations is a good idea, and an increasing number of people seem to think it is, you're no longer talking about anyone alive who has any memory of the thing being done or of doing the thing. And that throws up very, very deep organizational issues apart from anything else. Uh, Who in the American context is deserving of money and who should pay the money? This is this is not a theoretical uh, discussion anymore. Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, uh, recently set up a, a committee to look into reparations in California, and it reported back recently uh, that um, a, a black uh, Californians who, could, who who were descendants or potential descendants of slaves should be paid, I think, a couple of million dollars each, and others have come up with much higher. Um, sums of money uh, that should be paid. Uh, there's, as I say, much to be said because, among other things, you're no longer really talking about people who have done a wrong paying money to people who were wronged. You're talking about people who look like people who did a wrong in the past paying money to people who look like people who were wronged. Add to that the obvious organizational nightmare, which would make the Israeli case look positively straightforward. Oh, it makes the Israeli oh. case look easy. This does. Yes, it- I mean, I mean, what do you do, for instance? With, I mean, first of all, I, I mean, there is a there is a meltdown in America always about w- w- whether or not or why more Black Americans do not register to vote, and the argument is often that they don't in sufficient numbers produce the required documentation to prove their residency and and much else. Uh, There was a debate a couple of years ago, which Kamala Harris weighed into about where she claimed that basically, you know, black Americans don't have access to a photocopier and therefore couldn't possibly prove uh, under voting laws who they were. So, so, that's just on a very straightforward issue, which is proving who you are. Um, proving who your ancestors were. I mean, what's the idea? A great 23 and Me test of all Americans or black Americans. Uh, what do you do when you discover that people are descended from slave owners and slaves? Which, which is very common. Very common. The slave trade was 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 sourced, but it was the organizers of it at the very root were, were of course, black Africans. Uh, who continued slaving into the current era and still do today in some cases in countries like Sudan. Uh, but what would you do? Would, would that person get half of the millions awarded to somebody who was fully descended from slaves? Why should um, a Vietnamese American who arrived in the 1970s, say, be paying money to somebody whose ancestors were provably wronged 150 years ago? This is this is an impossible uh, conundrum, and the one of the reasons I raise it is not simply to dismiss it. I, I, I want to take the claim seriously. And, well, you and, and discuss the Israeli case in your book, and that was I would have only bothered to look further. Uh, I, uh, right. Because I only bothered to look further because the Israeli case is in yeah. the war on the West. 
Yes, and but I, so, I mean, I want to look at it seriously and take it seriously. I I think, however, one of the conclusions that I've come to is that the people who are playing around with the reparations thing clearly don't actually take it seriously themselves. They, as Gavin Newsom showed by effectively distancing himself from the conclusions of the inquiry uh, of committee of inquiry that he set up, it is impossible to imagine. So, certain politicians, principally of the of the left in America and elsewhere talk about reparations as if sort of throwing a bone uh, to the electorate and know, cynically know, that what they are discussing and playing around with is utterly impossible. And I think that there's something quite wicked in that because you are telling a portion of the public, who, who some of whom won't know better and will trust their politicians, that if they just hang around... There might be a huge payday coming their way in a few years. Mm. The money fairy will come. Yeah, and what will that do long term other than to store up a new type of resentment among a certain type of person who, who, will, who will think, I was told that the reparations were coming. I was sitting around waiting for them, and now they're not. And uh, what, how dare you keep my money from me will be the logical conclusion. It's just, I personally think that the, the administrative difficulties with this is the silver bullet argument. But, I yeah. mean, these people really, uh, I've noticed this across the whole of wokery, because they discount the past. Uh, you know, the past has nothing to teach us. And there is no information from the future. They really do think that anything is possible, that you can fly to the moon by flapping your arms basically. Yes. So maybe I'm being too loyally by saying this is not possible. You can't, you are never going to be able to do this. Look at what happened in Israel. And there does seem to be, I did notice, I mean, Coates mentioned it in a couple of places, but there d does seem to be no willingness to reckon with just how difficult it has been for the German and Israeli government to, to do this mm -hmm. properly. Even when you had named known people sometimes yes. tracked down by the expedient of a set of numbers on their arm. And if you want to know long-term where, where this can go, I mean, consider, consider something like, look, when Greek politics goes wrong or when the Greek economy crashes, what is one of the go-to things that populist politicians of left and right, not a term I generally like to use, but for shorthand on this occasion, that populist politicians of left and right immediately go to, it is... Germany owes us money, money for the Money for occupied, world. yes, for the occupation of Greece. Uh, so, so whenever, the, whenever the Greeks crash their economy, <laughs> there's always this thing held, held out that maybe we can get the Germans to pay for it because of 1940s. Yes. And, and now, again, I, I see no likelihood that, although in certain ways, funnily enough, the German economy does end up having to bail out Mediterranean Europe uh, on a semi-regular basis, Nevertheless, I see no likelihood of a funds transfer from um, uh, from Berlin to Athens. So, but what is this? It is a hopeless thing dangled uh, in front of people and an expression of resentment. Well, resentment like that is not a healthy thing to encourage among publics, let alone, and it's the line I, I lift from Nietzsche with, with, a credit, with uh, credit, but... What we're really seeing in the reparations argument now is is what Nietzsche refers to as people tearing at wounds long since healed and then crying about their hurt. I'm not saying that the that wounds of slavery have been utterly healed, but they are considerably closed, certainly more so than they were in the 1860s, say. And more so than Israelis were confronting in, say, the 50s or 60s. Absolutely, when yeah. when everybody lived with the knowledge and the experience of what had just happened. Mm -hmm. So this this I th I think one of the sort of as it go a go to bits of wisdom in our area is that we should be suspicious of people who are trying to open up wounds that were otherwise closing. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say we should be blithe about the past or cover anything over. Far from it. I want as much historical inquiry and knowledge as possible. But um, we should be suspicious of the people who, who want things to have been worse and present things as worse today 
and present solutions which are impossible to imagine. Just impossible. I mean, I do have the, I admit I have the lawyers thing here. There, there comes a time where you have to draw a line under it that this is why statutes of limitation exist. This is why raised judicata exists. Because if you don't put it to bed, that is how historically, and we've got the Roman jurists writing about this, you finish up with cycles of vendetta. If you don't put something yep. to bed, that's how you actually finish up with inherited duties of vengeance and banes and ven- and problems that have existed in Italy since antiquity with vend- vendetta. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. interesting that you mention Nietzsche because I think that's a good bridge to the next thing I want to ask and because I think I think it's salient here. Uh, I noticed in your gratitude section you drew on some of Nietzsche's arguments about the dangers of uh, risentiment. Yeah. I'd be grateful if you could just adumbrate those for Liberty Law Talk listeners, because I mean, I, not everybody reads Nietzsche, but I thought that was the best section of the book, I'll be quite frank, and I just would like to hear you s- summarise it in your own words for us all. <laughs> That's very kind. I, I, it was, it was, um, I'm terribly conscious when I write books that, you, that it's not enough to simply present a problem, but you've also got to try to present some answers, and that they have to be answers that are, of an equal depth to the problem that you're analyzing. Nietzsche is, of course, one of the great philosophers uh, and also a philosopher who has to be treated with great care. And yes, he agreed. is dynamite. Uh, he really is dynamite. His insights are unparalleled, but you, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to pick your way carefully through him. Badly, badly read Nietzsche, and you might even argue fully read Nietzsche, can be a very dangerous thing. Uh, but th- some of the insights are searing. And resentiment, let's say there is a, there is a difference between resent- resentiment, as Nietzsche uses it, and resentment, but let's not get into that. Let's just call it resentment, so, mm. so we don't, don't sound like we're trying to be Ponzi and French. Um, <laughs> resentment, uh, Nietzsche analyzes the, the, the person of resentment, and um, uh, the person of resentment is, is a person who has an explanation for everything that has gone wrong in their lives. And the explanation is everything other than themselves. You know, it's any outside force. It can be another person. I suspect everyone listening has at some point met a person of resentment, a resentful person. The interesting thing about the resentful people is that they can come from every imaginable race, background, class, economic strata, as you probably know, Helen, I mean, we can all think of people who are extremely materially well off and seem to be enormously resentful people. I think we can probably also think of people in our lives who have very little in worldly terms, who are very non-resentful people, who are people who approach the world with great grace mm. and who receive grace in turn. I, I use um, a section of Nietzsche's work on the genealogy of morals because he explains that there's only one way out that you one way to knock the person of resentment out of the life of resentment and that is for somebody and Nietzsche doesn't know exactly who he says a secular priest which is an interesting idea but he says somebody needs to stand over the life of the person of resentment and say there is somebody who's ruined your life entire the person is you of course that's the last thing that anyone who's resentful wishes to hear and it's not something that because so much of this is wrapped up with a self-diagnosed sense of mental illness. It's Mm -hmm. not something that someone, whether they are mentally ill or not, wants to hear that, no, Mm. I'm sorry, you're responsible for yourself. It's awfully Norman Tebbett, you know, get on your bike. Yes, it's, um, well, it's, it's to say that you'd have to start again, among other things. I mean, you'd have to start your world over again and get back to the root of the problem and try to address it, which can be done. But the interesting thing I think in Nietzsche's observations is not just that, but is the observation that, that the only the only thing that can counter resentment as a force of uh, that can that can knock it out, as it were, to think in sort of Star Wars laser beam like terms, is 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 gratitude. That that resentment the only antidote, the best antidote to resentment is gratitude. And what does that look like? Well, in the simplest terms, you know, I can get up in the morning and I can resent the things I do not have. 
and the things I do not have a, a legion. For me, as for every other person in the world, <laughs> there is so much that we don't have. And you can approach your entire day and indeed an entire life in that light. Mm-hmm. And so, and you can find people to blame for it. You know, my sister was always a favorite of my parents and that's why I don't, you know, so on. All sorts of versions of this. Yes. And equally, you can get up in the morning and think of all the things you have. I mean, and, and the funny thing is, of course, is that although this is a very straightforward bit of wisdom, it's one you do have to be reminded of. I and mean, you have to work at too. You have to work at it. I mean, you and I are fortunate enough to have grown up in societies with civil order, for instance. I've been in plenty of countries, war zones, where there is no such order. And so I have a special appreciation for the simple fact that if something is done to me in the street, someone who is paid by the state will try to help rectify that and stop it and, mm-hmm. and, and, and so on. You, you can't just go around beating people with sticks. That, that's not to be taken for granted now or historically. We have a system of law. Again, unless you've seen a country where law has broken down uh, or is totally corrupted, to live in a laws-based system is, is, is simply one of the greatest blessings that, that you can have. I've often had to quote significant jurists, uh, judges, sometimes from court judgments, sometimes writing extrajudicially, sometimes operating in the Roman style, juristic style, going back to antiquity, pointing out that the most important thing in the world is actually order and everything else flows from that. Because if you don't have order, what you have is chaos, not anarchy, but chaos, which is actually worse because people constantly take everything into their own hands and administer everything by their own lights of justice. And I'm paraphrasing, the yes. Roman lawyers listening will realise I'm paraphrasing. Ulpian goes on a great, he wrote great Roman jurist, goes on a big anti-self-help rant, trying to get people all over the empire, not just in Italy itself, where it was well established. You must go to the police. You must make a report. You must let the state do this. You must let the state bring people to court. It is not your job. You you are not that person. Because people have to be trained out of taking vengeance. It's very natural. Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I'd add that that there is, an, there is a natural human instinct to wish to tear things up. In our own age, it can be heard in the sort of chants like burn it down, Mm. you know, uh, that can be heard as sort of anarchist and and other marches. It's really nasty. It's it's very nasty. And and I always say it can only be said by people who've grown up in enormous privilege, in the privilege of peace and in the privilege of security. And They don't know what the alternative is like. They don't have any idea of what the alternative is. And if were law and order to break down in their society, they would be um, first up against the wall. I mean, you know, many of the, one of the things I think that often makes great writers is, is, and great political theorists is that they have seen into the abyss of what the alternatives are. And certainly the writers I most admire, the obvious one is Edmund Burke, who, who, who saw what happened in France and saw with great terror what was going to come next, including the terror. Including um, the terror, exactly, precisely. <laughs> you might say Montaigne uh, was fortunate enough, I say fortunate enough, it wasn't fortunate at the time, but to have lived through the wars of religion and to have seen, to have seen the extremes of barbarity that people were willing to go to in the name of, of, of faith and, 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 and their, their perception of God. And to have seen the breakdown that the wars of religion caused in, in, in the Europe of his day yes. was to come out the other side with an enormous admiration for order, including the absolute centrality of legal order. Because one of the things that got me after I retired from full-time practice at the end of 2016 that got me into this debate and instead of just writing novels and 
and fiction of various kinds or writing book reviews of other novels, mm-hmm. which is what I'd always done historically, was what appeared to me to be a concerted attack on the rule of law. And, the, mm. I mean, from Ulpian onwards, people have generally divided the rule of law up into eight different heads and it all gets a bit complicated. And that, that's worth reading. It's in Hayek, it's in Raz, it's in Ulpian, it's worth read. But the basic principle of the rule of law that you can s- distill it all down into one is treat like cases alike. Mm. And mm. all of this race baiting that says you should treat someone differently uh, in terms of the opportunities you give them or in terms of the way you treat them interpersonally and so on and so forth are based on smashing up that core legal principle of treat like cases yeah. alike. Yes. And and I would add that, uh, I give some examples in The War on the West, but I, I would add that there are those who say today the system of law is white. The, I know the laws who- are white. And there is so much danger in that, mm. as well as simple inability to recognize precisely what you just said, which is the law that is set up in our countries it is fortunate in being blind, that, that justice is, when put in statue form, is literally blinded, mm. and that that is the system we are fortunate enough to have. To turn that into a system which is, like everything else, accused of being institutionally racist or based in whiteness, is to pretend that the law, as we have it and enjoy it, should not be enjoyed by our, by non-white people and that some other system of justice should occur with them. And if, if the people who, who make these claims cannot have thought, like the people who say burn it down, cannot possibly have thought about the consequences of their own claims. And they never seem to think even one chess move ahead, you know. They see the living embodiment of this is a quip that is often said among lawyers and is probably known elsewhere, but I first heard it from my pupil master when I was a baby barrister. Uh, And he used to say when something like this tended to happen, people hadn't thought their thoughts through to the end, basically, with a piece of legislation. He used to say, this is a reminder, Helen, and always remember this, that the only law always in force is the law of unintended consequences. Mm, And it stings, but it's true. It's a very wise, very wise observation. Just on the Nietzsche point again, and uh, I'll because because that chapter was so moving and it really did make me think. And it, I, I did that thing of going out and cycling around the neighbourhood and just thinking about some of the ideas that that you raised. Because Nietzsche talks about a lot of issues in genealogy of morals, and that's where all of just for listeners, that's where all of this is coming from. Some of those concern. He has a particular views on, on people being victims, on the idea of victimhood. Now, I'm going to say, I'll, I'll just throat clear and disclose here. I'm asking about this, what insights may come from the, his perceptions and discussions of victimhood, because the most substantive Roman criticisms of early Christianity concerned its valorization of victimhood. Yes. Now, there yes, are lots, yes, yes. And lo- lots of other Roman criticisms. Many of them are very silly, like, oh, they're all they're cannibals because of the communion sure. and that kind of thing. Many of them are very silly. This one is not silly. Uh, and the, uh, basically the way various Roman jurists and Roman writers put it was the idea that victims, you know, this religion, they, they will say, this superstition, superstitio, claims that victims have something to tell us by virtue of their victimhood. This appears in its clearest form in a writer called Celsus in the second century AD, and uh, Nietzsche revisits a lot of Celsus. And uh, when I was a, an undergraduate, a classics undergraduate, an uh, academic had actually written a paper comparing phrases in Celsus with phrases in, in Nietzsche. And I have to say, it did get a bit tedious after a while. It was like he'd run Celsus and genealogy of morals through Turn It In and then pulled out all the red highlights. But the point mm. was a fair one. Is there something still in that? It's not Nietzschean in this case. It's a Roman insight. And if so, what should we do with it? Yes, a Roman insight. There's certainly Nietzsche lifts. But, but I mean, Nietzsche is, of course, an anti-Christian philosopher. 
And um, that's one, one of the many reasons why I say you have to pick your way through him with great care. The observation on, I mean, it's, it's really Nietzsche's principal objection to the Christian ethos is, is exactly to say it's the valorization of suffering. There is a lot to that. I would say it's simply an example of the fact that everything can go too far. As I always mm. say, absolutely everything in the world, including all virtues, can be corrupted by being led to extremes. There is a great, I mean, I regard the Christian insights on suffering, the Christian theology on suffering as being among the most profound contributions that Christianity gives to the world. Uh, I think from it, we get many of our current perceptions about rights and about the dignity of individuals and our sympathy for individuals who have fallen on hard times and much more. And I don't say any of this lightly because, again, there are societies in the world and there are, there are ethical systems elsewhere in the world which do not regard people who are unfortunate as being deserving of sympathy or, or, or support, for instance. Uh, belief systems that believe in reincarnation, for instance, mm. very often uh, believe that the person who is um, on the street begging does not deserve alms because they did something in a previous life that has caused them to be in this situation and to, to help them in any way would be to actually harm the system mm. uh, of justice that is occurring. This is a sort of cosmic justice. I saw this in Cambodia, actually. People who'd yes. had their feet blown off by standing on on Khmer Rouge landmines were not treated with a great deal of sympathy because the, the, the no, argument was that no. in a previous life they'd done something bad and so that's why the foot had been blown off as, by standing on a mine. Can you imagine, can you imagine being so, a, a person in that position? I mean, a double, a double whammy from fate I mean, to, both, you know, in, to, to both wound you and then wound you again. So Christianity does produce this extremely important ethos of compassion and, and, and an ethic around suffering. It is, I would argue that it is true that, 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 that some wisdom can come from suffering. It's just that it's not inevitable and it isn't limitless. Mm. For instance, who, when, and I'm making this rather trivial, but I, I hope it isn't, who, when they have suffered a blow in their lives, does not approach the people they come across that day in a spirit of greater charity and kindness? If um, something terrible has happened to you in a day, you might see the unfortunate person uh, begging on the pavement in, in, a, in a kindlier light. You might, you might not pass them by as easily or as willingly. You might even do something to help. My observation is simply that that suffering does, to an extent, remind us of the fact that we, we are all mortal, we're all capable of falling from high to low, and, uh, and that, uh, you know, if affliction afflicts us all. Mm. However, there is a, there is a perversion of, of, of the ethic of, of suffering, which is that simply by nature, by the nature of having suffered something, Wisdom must naturally accrue from it. That was what Kels that's what Kelsus was arguing against. He thought yes. that was nonsense. And it's been made, it's a point that's been made by certain people our own day. There's a writer of the political left who's a friend of mine in Britain who observed many years ago that actually this is one of the problems of the contemporary left, is that it it thinks of, for instance, peoples who have suffered as inevitably behaving well if the suffering is stopped. Mm. Uh, you know, if you live under a dictator and you, you suffered under a dictator, if the dictator is removed, the people will be good. <laughs> Unfortunately, this time and again is shown not to be the case. Uh, you, can, you can suffer and be bad. Or be nothing. That was an, that's the other thing. I, I had Kelsus's line about just because you have suffered or because you have been sentenced, because, of course, he's arguing with Christians, Kelsus was, and, so, and mm. Jesus had been executed. Uh, for a public order offence. Romans didn't like public order offences. And he's saying just because someone has gone to jail or someone has been executed, that doesn't mean they necessarily have any insights for the rest yes. of us. And as I was riding around the neighbourhood thinking about that chapter, the George Floyd thing came to me. You know, a Roman yes. would have been horrified by a citizen, not so much a non-citizen, certainly a citizen being killed by a policeman. And the policeman would have been in a lot of trouble and a legionary would have been cashiered. You know, this was not something you yeah. did. And 
So isn't it enough that the policeman was tried and convicted and sent to jail for murder? Yeah, that this is how a Roman jurist would look at it. You don't have to pretend that George Floyd is some sort of marvellous person. That was what came to me. Absolutely. I mean, this, I agree. Uh, it, I mean, there's a sort of perversity in the ethic of our time, this. Epitomised, if I can say so, by Nancy Pelosi coming out with some fellow senators after the trial of the policeman who killed George Floyd. She, she came out on the steps of the Senate and looked up in the air and she said, thank you, George Floyd. Thank you for giving your life for justice. I didn't know that. I don't follow American mm. politics. Oh, my Lord. I mean, um, I don't think that George Floyd set out that morning to improve the life of the average American by giving his life. I mean, this is a uh, perversity of uh, a, a sort of perverted form of watered or spilt Christian ethics and and much more spilling into our time. And there's there's a lot to, there's a lot to criticise in that. Um, there's something to be said for it. I mean, it has to be said, which is on this particular occasion, people trying to ameliorate the the wound being felt by black Americans who feel that there is an injustice in the way in which they're treated by the police. You know, I mean, I, I think that probably what happened was that people overdid it mm. for fear that black Americans and others might overreact themselves in response to this terrible uh, event. But my own view is that, is that it's almost always unwise to to interpret an entire society through the lens of one horrific act and that that is to an extent what has been happening and been happening with a very free run in America and the rest of the West in, in, in recent times. I mean, if I can give one very quick other example, it, it, one that not many other people have lingered over, although I see that the Canadian writer Jonathan Kay has recently, is that a couple of years ago there was a moral panic in Canada when it was claimed that the bodies of Indigenous children, the graves of Indigenous children, had been found by a Catholic school in Canada. And the implication was that this was a mass grave and that the children had been killed somehow by the Catholic school because they were Indigenous and that this was a sort of genocide. Not allowed indigenous. to die or just died of disease or... It wasn't made clear, but it, every every innuendo was possible. Mm. And this became very real very fast because people started burning down churches in Canada. Oh, I remember this, yeah. Including uh, uh, indigenous wood-built churches, which will not be replaced. And even people who were close to the prime minister uh, of Canada, you know, started doing sort of burn it down. To, to this day, not one grave has been uncovered. I understand there, there are, what you said in, in the book. I mean, I don't know whether the news cycle has moved on, but I understand from what you said in The War on the West is it was almost as if they were reaching for a similar history as to what's happened in Ireland yes. with the industrial schools and the maudlin asylums. And even there it's been exaggerated, but not to the same degree. And there's nothing. It's a big fat no. zero. They, 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 they said they were going to do ultrasound on the ground. Ground and, penetrating and radar did. is what archaeologists do, yes. Yeah. And and, there, and there, there's nothing there, so so people would, I mean, and then this is a very interesting a perversity of our time, as, as as you say, Helen. I mean, p partly it's sort of wanting their own version of the American racial history imposed upon itself, or what happened with the church in Ireland, yes. which really was an extraordinary scandal. There's a very successful new book published by a British author recently. It's called This Is Not America. It's saying, let's not impose American racial politics on Britain. But, but that is something that people have been doing with great abandon recently, which is combined with another interesting trait in our time, which is to try to think the worst of ourselves. It's very understandable to want to think the best of yourselves as a mm. society. It's a very strange, I think, rather modern phenomenon to wish to think the worst of yourselves. So that instead of saying, well, hang on a moment, let's just see if there are, if there is any evidence of the mass killing or mass graves before getting, you know, all burning about things. I, I think people are actually, the, one of the reasons why the Canadian media has not revisited this panic is because, A, they're probably embarrassed, oh, but gosh, B, yes. they want it. They want it to be the case. They would they would rather that mass graves were discovered than that they weren't. And I, I'm not being flippant in no, that. No, no, genuinely... I've seen this. This has happened in Australia as well. There's been an exaggeration of what has done what, which was bad. 
Yes. Exaggeration of what has been done historically to the Australian Aborigines. And people then very carefully investigate it. Anthropologists and archaeologists go and investigate it, sometimes government commissions, and find out that it wasn't as bad. And that's never yes. as reported with the same fanfare as afterwards. No. It's less bad Absolutely. than Canada. You don't have the same sort of nonsense in Australia as you do in, in Canada. But that trait, that, that element is already present. And it has, I mean, I wrote about this a bit in The Strange Death of Europe, but I said this in the Australian context, that it's very interesting that in our own lifetimes, the happy country has been turned into a darkened country, a mm. sort of slightly polluted country. And uh, I think this is a very interesting turnaround in our time. And it's happened, it's happened, I mean, one of the, th the, the points I'd make in the War in the West is the way this has been done with American history, most mm -hmm. obviously, where, I mean, I give the example of some of the great figures of American founding, like Thomas Jefferson. People positively want Jefferson to be seen in a, ne in a negative light. I, a little while ago, spoke at one of the great institutions alongside the United States that Thomas Jefferson set up, which is the University of Virginia. And uh, I mentioned in my remarks there the fact that actually the DNA evidence that suggests that Thomas Jefferson was the father of Sally Hemings' children is, is not conclusive. There is a Jefferson gene in the Hemings family genes, but it does not mean that Thomas Jefferson raped his slave. However, some people are absolutely insistent about this and that it can't have been a relative of his. It must be of Thomas Jefferson himself. And it was, it was quite amusing to me that after my remarks, a woman in the audience came over to me positively furious that I had mm. said that Thomas Jefferson might not be a rapist. And, and I, I said to her, you know, it's very interesting because a hundred years ago, if I'd have spoken at UVA and said that Thomas Jefferson was a rapist, I'd have had people who were furious with me. Today, you're furious if he isn't a rapist. That's an odd position to be in. I understand the former more than I do the latter. I understand people's desire to w think well of themselves and their country's history. Mm. I think it is rather baffling perversity of the modern age that people wish to look as negatively as possible at their past and are positively furious if there's anything good in it. The former Australian Prime Minister, who's still alive, used to describe this. He had a good expression for it, that I think he would be very happy if you stole it and propagated it widely. This is he John called, Howard. Yes, John Howard. He called it the black armband view of history. And when he used the phrase, he used to stand up and say, this is the black armband view of history. And for listeners, uh, I'm wrapping my hand around my opposite shoulder, <laughs> the upper arm, back arm back. <laughs> yes, that's John Howard's. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, that is very good. Yes, the black armband view of history, he used to call it. Steal yes. that from him and propagate it outside Australia. I will do. I will do. Well, of course, as I say, I mean, much of the the thinking on this has come from Australians who noticed this happening because it happened so swiftly in Australia. Yes. It's happened relatively slowly in America by comparison. It took longer to try to argue that their founders had feet of clay. Yes. Partly because their yeah. founders, uh, I mean, some of Australia's founders were a bit equivocal, uh, genuine mixtures of good and bad, that is. The, the country became better and more orderly and, uh, and arguably better governed than the United States over a process of history. It didn't have these stars mm. at the beginning. You know, I mean, Alfred Deakin mm. is not George Washington. He was a very capable and able prime minister and an interesting character, but he was not Washington or Jefferson and did not write like either of those men or anything like that. So it, it had a very different history and, of course, a very equivocal start because it started as a penal colony. To turn away from the war on the West at the moment, which we've kind of hashed over quite bits of it, and just sort of to step back and broaden out a little bit, you were a speaker uh, at the National Conservatism Conference in the UK and I, I saw your mm -hmm. talk at the Natural History Museum. And I, I just thought for American listeners who may be familiar with the US version of the National Conservatism, Conservatism Conference, it might be just worth asking you, what, your, what was your general impression of the UK National Conservatism Conference and, and where do you think it goes from here? I, as I've said to Yoram Hatzoni, who's the sort of founder of the National Conservatism Movement, a distinguished Israeli uh, thinker and philosopher. As I've said to him, I'm sort of two thirds in agreement with the National Conservatism platform. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I yes, I spoke at the, the recent uh, London event. I've spoken before at their events in Rome and uh, and in Florida. 
I, I didn't attend enough of the conference, but I've watched quite a lot of it since. And a lot of friends were speakers uh, at the conference. I think, and I've said this to Yara and myself, is that one of the interesting things about the term nationalism is, is that it is like liberalism. It's a shapeshifter term. Mm. Lord Frost says the same thing. Yeah, it changes meaning as it crosses borders. I mean, for instance, nationalism in the Israeli context is, 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 is one thing, something I happen to think is a good thing. I think the Israeli state would not exist without, without Israeli nationalism. I think that in America, it is a relatively easy to talk about uh, movement. In Europe, it, it becomes extremely difficult. Mm. I mean, let me give you a couple of examples. But I mean, for instance, if you say British nationalism, in Britain, people th- immediately think of the British National Party, which was a far right party, which is now mm. defunct, run by a, a horrible man who was actually a sort of, you know, Nazi uh, apologist and much else. So if you just said British nationalism in the British context, you would you would alarm people because they would think of a far-right movement. Now, however, if you say Scottish nationalism, yes. I mean, there is a Scottish National Party, the Scottish Nationalist Party called the SNP. They are in government in Scotland. Not very happily, uh, admittedly, at the moment, but... Not at the moment, very happily, and, and not a party I adore. But uh, the the SNP are not regarded as far right. Take it to Ireland, and you know Irish nationalism is a very complex thing, but it is not regarded as a far right movement. Uh, go to Germany and try German nationalism. That's a different thing. Mm. The same thing in Italy. It's very difficult. Italy's very complex one. Mm. Spain. I mean, the point is simply that Europe, <laughs> Europe is always very, very complex. We have had such a, a, a well-recorded and difficult history. Um, we have we had the wars of religion. We had the wars of nation states. We had the disastrous wars of the ideologies, the twin horror ideologies of the 20th century of fascism and communism. We've had all of this in Europe. And so, you know, as, as I've often said, 20th century Europe in particular still sits behind uh, crime scene tape. Mm. People are still trying to work out how on earth it happened. I mean, that's why a lot of the philosophy of Europe, some of the culture of Europe even, is effectively behind crime scene tape mm. still. Because the question remains, how, how did it happen? How did Europe do this? Uh, how did the most civilized societies on earth, most, most cultured societies on earth, how did a city like Vienna turn from what it was in 1902, the cultural centerpiece of the world, into what Vienna was in the 1940s and what it allowed, and what it encouraged, this so this makes everything to do with the term nationalism just incredibly difficult. I think it needs to be decomplexified to some extent. We need to work out what is and what is not, you know, legitimate. I think that people have, if 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 one a group of people have the right to national identity and national belonging, then everybody really has to. You can't say only some have that right and others don't and one country has and one country doesn't. But I say that at the same time as saying I would not want to encourage a nationalist movement in Germany. No, I think that's, I still think that's fraught with danger, even though the Germans appear to have gone completely soft and squishy. You know, my partner has this expression that, that particularly in the early days of the Ukraine war, where Germany was just useless, that Germany went from being ter- oh, yeah. terrifying to a kind of joke. Well, the, the one thing that the, the Germans still do is believe that they should direct the moral course of history. It's just that they do it in a different light today. Yes. I mean, they they try to encourage, you know, the rest of Europe to be like them. And um, I, I, it's, it's much more desirable. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not desirable. It's a much more desirable <laughs> ethic than, than the ones they tried to force Europe into in the past. Oh, but nevertheless, there is this strange 
endless German presumption that what, what Germany does is what Europe should do. Yes, it's fueled, of course, in, by the power of the German economy, which is still significant, even allowing for all the problems oh, yeah. since the war in, in Ukraine. The ability to speak out and disagree with what used to be called political correctness. I'm showing my age. I, I worked out that I'm, I think I'm six or seven years older than you. So it was political correctness when I went to university. And these days is called woke, uh, is for some people severely curtailed. You know, people really do get sacked for questioning DEI training days at work, like the uh, Jodie Shaw at Smith College, and she really did get sacked yep. for questioning DEI training days at work. And it's not just her. This is a very common story. You just happen to flag her up in the book. People get sacked for saying the wrong thing on social media. People get sacked for telling a joke that doesn't land with everyone else in the tea room. A genuine privilege both you and I share is freedom of speech without our jobs being placed under threat. What should Joe and Josephine Average do? What can they do? It's a, a question I think about a lot, and you're right, Helen. You and I are, and we should confess our privilege in a, in oh, a it is absolutely position pri- of being able to say yes. what we think, and so it's also a pleasure. And I think that everyone who has that privilege should should use it yeah. and try to make it easier for everybody else. I believe that, the, as you say, cases of people, they're often dismissed by people as being sort of right-wing talking points. They're really not. I mean, you know, you can be a librarian at a college or you can be a partner at KPMG, for instance, who uh, was fired after saying that he thought that implicit bias training was a crock. And that's um, what he said, very Australian. <laughs> and it, it's true. It is a crock. <laughs> uh, it's true. Uh, and, he, and he lost his job because junior employees said that they weren't happy with him saying that he thought that implicit bias training was a waste of everyone's time. But, you know, so, so you can be a person of considerable power and influence and, and lose it all, or you can be somebody of, you know, really relatively little uh, power and influence and lose it all. My suggestion is always, when I'm asked this, that I don't like to encourage acts of kamikaze-like bravery. I mean, I would like everyone to be braver, but I, I know that people, particularly young people starting off in their careers, you, you, they, they don't want to implode, you know, um, immediately. What I do suggest is that everyone should just be a little bit braver, you know, and speak up a little more. So, you see, if in the case you, you, you cited earlier, of, you know, we are talking about earlier of if... Um, you know, if somebody says something that's sort of anti-white racist or sort of generalizing about white people would be just to say, you know, oh, that doesn't sound, that doesn't land well. You know, that, would that's not, would that be good if you said that about other groups? You know, do you, do you say that about other racial groups? I hope not. You know, I say that if people, if people are given reading lists <laughs> by colleagues or let alone bosses, uh, they should say, oh, oh, I've got some books you should read. I'll read your books, you read mine. Mm. You know, it, and if they say no, they go, oh, I, that's, that's not a free exchange of ideas then, is it? It's, it's me being expected to listen to a sermon. Uh, is that in the deal? Is that in the contract? That's I mean, I think people, there, are a lot of things, there are a lot of things that people can do that are not, are not totally destructive to them or wouldn't be totally destructive to them, and which could just encourage people a little bit more. I mean, I feel very sorry for the people. I I think the worst are people who know that what they're doing is wrong and nevertheless go along with it out of weakness. And I I say that's the worst because people who do that grow to hate themselves, Mm. you know, because it's one thing to be a bit cowardly. It's another thing to know that you're a coward and, uh, that that eats away at a person. Actually, it makes you realise you're it makes you think you're nothing mm. because you're not far away from it. Actually, to to be uh, and to not identify the truth as you see it, or let alone truth as it is, and to remain silent is a profoundly demoralising experience, which I encourage people not to go through. They don't have to put themselves through it. Right. Try, if you can, to fight in those circumstances to fight back or you, you do finish up, you know, the hollow man with the headpiece filled with straw. It's just, you, yeah, there's, just no, there's nothing left. Yeah, it's a very sad position to be in and people should, med- you know, because the best advice of 
you know, what to be in your life is, is, is to imagine what it is you would like to be and to get as close as possible to that. And what I've just described is the opposite. I mean, it's, mm. it's to see a cringing, embarrassing mm. person who hates themselves. The, the other thing that, um, that uh, and this is, this, is, uh, this is partly a crowdsourced question that's come from family members. There are quite a decent number of people, particularly in the part of the world where I live in, which is the, sort of the classic home counties, Tory shires. They're like my partner, also retired from a job in the city who don't have public profiles, so they're not like you or me, but they do have expertise and the financial freedom to speak or to do something. Mm. And my partner very much falls into this category. How can they help push back against the tide? What can they do? And I, I know I've got, now I've got King Canute symbols going on there, but how can they help push back or fight back? What are good strategies for them to pursue? Okay. Because I do think there's something, that there's work to do, for people who aren't public figures in any way, but also can't be harmed because they are financially secure. Yes, financial security in this era does matter enormously. It's one of the reasons why the people I actually loathe the most, uh, if I treat myself to a bit of loathing, are the people with FU money mm. who don't say FU. Yes, I, I, I agree because whilst I don't have FU money, I, I, my partner and I have a considerable amount and I am quite happy to get up and say FU and do so regularly, usually right. more politely than that, but yes. Can you, imagine if, can you imagine if you were sort of Bill Gates rich and were yes. still able to be intimidated by junior employees, you know? I yes. Mean, so, so, yeah, I, but, but people who are secure, I think, uh, you know, are, are what I describe as the adults who are most missing from the room. Uh, there's something very strange about about a society in which the adults pipe down because it suggests that we put no premium whatsoever on experience or wisdom. Yes. <laughs> we put a premium only on youth and ignorance. And I'm not saying that all young people are ignorant, but, you know, you're, you're more ignorant at the age of 20 than you are at the age of 40 than you are at the age of 60. Yes. And it's a very curious society and by no means common throughout history for a society to only listen to those who know the least. So my own view is that people who are older and are secure financially should, in every way they can, say, excuse me, but I know something too. And they should say that um, in their lives. They should say that to people they in, uh, encounter. They should say it to institutions they're involved with. They should lead a, a counter-movement. Uh, that doesn't need to have its own aims other than to say, we don't want this crap thrown in our way. For instance, uh, I think that the people who are secure in a society should point out the actually terrible things that are going on, which we are being distracted from noticing. For instance, it is with almost 100% certainty that I can predict which school districts fail the most in America. Uh, and it is the districts which talk about historical injustice, that talk about grand strategies to uproot white supremacy. You can tell that a teaching union is failing when it starts to talk about these grandiose things that are not in its purview. Why do I say that? Because with almost 100% certainty, you can check the, the reading levels, the literacy levels, the attainment at math, and um, particularly among minority students and particularly among young black students, and you will notice that these are the places with the lowest attainment levels. Yes. I mean, you have uh, uh, areas uh, I, I visited in the US where 7% of black children leave school, you know, with a math or, you know, language literacy. Oh, um, that is just shocking. I mean, utterly. And that's utterly worse than the shocking. worst parts of Glasgow. Much worse. And the SNP oh, hasn't yeah. exactly been a fabulous government for, for Scottish education, no. but that is much, much worse than the worst districts in Glasgow. I, I'm sorry, I used to work in the Scottish Parliament, so I'm sort of familiar with the issues there. Yeah. I mean, well, exactly. I mean, it's, it's a very pertinent example because. If you set, a, wherever you set up a grandiose explanation, a totalistic explanation for everything that's going wrong, in the case of Scottish nationalists, it's if only we were independent, you know, if only we didn't have Westminster ruling over us. And 
this is meant to explain everything. Look under the bonnet and you see they can't run the health service, they can't run the schools, the Scottish education system that actually used to be a jewel. Oh, it was a jewel in the in crown. Britain. But it's still not as bad as those American figures, but it did used to be... It, England compared unfavourably with Scotland, and I actually lived in Scotland during the period of that transition, which was quite unpleasant yes. as Scottish schools yes. fell behind. But that's because because the, the, the Scottish nationalists can always point to, you know, if only we're independent. And it's the same with, with you know, the teaching unions and the failing school districts in, in the United States. Always, if only we could solve this unsolvable issue from the past that is not in our gift to solve, and you look under the bonnet and you can guarantee they're not doing the one thing they're meant to do. So uh, I think that it's a long way around, but I think that, the, that all those people who are in a position of, security should be, among other things, drawing attention to such things, trying to rectify such problems, and making sure that as societies we don't fall into these simplistic and self-harming interpretations of, of ourselves, because it is almost guaranteed that those explanations will solve nothing, because they don't actually explain everything by any means. Beyond that, which is good advice for pe people like my partner, which, who I think will be listening, will listen to this very carefully. Just coming back, and some of this came up at the National Conservatism Conference, and there are elements of it in the last, the conclusion to war on the West. More broadly, what sort of policy proposals do you have? Inevitably, this is a law-based law podcast, uh, so the lawyers are going to mm. ask about policy because we care about this sort of thing because we're often the policy makers. What sort of policy proposals do you have that may help reverse the ideological capture of so many British institutions? I, I, I'll confine it to Britain here because it is something I know better, at least. Well, in Britain, I mean, there's a lot to be said, and it differs from institution to institution. I simply think that nothing in receipt of government funds or taxpayer funds, let's say government doesn't own the money, no, nothing in receipt of taxpayer funds should be allowed to war on itself. Institutions are meant to exist to continue the legacy of the institution. They are not meant to war on the institution in question. So, for instance, if um, uh, the, the trustees of the Tate, to use one example that's close to my heart... Oh, the Whistler painting, yes. And, and much more, Stanley Spencer. They've, they've made an assault on their own collection. The, the trustees of the Tate are only in position uh, 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 because they are meant to preserve and and preserve for, uh, for the next generations uh, one of the great national collections. If the trustees of the Tate decide instead that their job is to stand as judge, jury, and executioner on the reputations of the artists whose artworks they are in possession of, they should uh, receive no funding from the government or anyone else. Uh, I mean, private funders can choose if they want to support this self-hating institution, they, absolutely. And they have that right to do what they want with their money, but no taxpayer money should ever go to an institution of the, of, of the state and of the nation which believes that its job is to war on the institution in question. In other, other words, the people who are meant to be the custodians of the culture should be the custodians of the culture. They should not regard their job as being the judges of it, particularly not if they believe their job is to be the judges who judge it in the nastiest and most uncharitable light imaginable. It is just extraordinary, the judging of, of the artist's character of the artist's character, not their art. <laughs> well, wherever I go in the world, I always want to see the national and local collections of anywhere. It is only in the Western democracies that we end up in this bizarre position of self-hatred. If you go to one of the great collections like the National Museum in Cairo, mm. you do not see the great collections from um, antiquity with big signs up saying, you know, you've got to remember that this was, you know, made by slaves and that, that there wasn't equal pay distribution among the people who created this staff of Tutankhamun's or, you know, they don't do this. They just say, here's the wonderful things we have, which we're very proud of, um, which we show to the world. I, I mean, 
there's always a different, I'm not holding that museum up as the totem of how to, how to present a museum to the world, but I'm just saying that is the normal. It is a lovely museum oh, though. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the way you do think. That's what, so that visitors to your country are shown the best of what you have. And the idea that that all your cultural institutions would be engaged in this weird act of self-harm. I mean, I was speaking recently to a friend at Harvard who said that Harvard University in the United States was talking recently of an inquiry, like so many institutions, an inquiry into what reparations Harvard University might need to pay, depending on... Harvard's benefiting from the slave trade. And this person I was speaking to said they pointed to the huge memorial at the center of Harvard to the the students and the graduates of that university who lost their lives in the um, Civil War fighting against the armies of the South. And and this person I I spoke to said he pointed at this and said, we've already paid. In blood. In blood, I think I think that the adults should say that sort of thing. I mean, we have a lot of know nothings in our societies now who, who very often uh, stumble upon our past as if it was a total secret hitherto. And I think that the adults should say, excuse me, but we know about this too, and it's possible we know more than you. For instance, you talk about the slave trade, but what do you know about it, historically or in the present? What do you know about what Britain did to abolish the slave trade? I mean, again, it's this light and dark thing. You can learn about but you can learn about British involvement in the slave trade, which is unarguable, and you can also learn that, that Britain led the world in abolishing this vile trade. And um, you don't need to teach only the good, but to teach only the bad is a very perverse thing. And to look at your collections and your history only in this negative light is is far more perverse than looking at it only in a positive light and much more damaging. And why we cannot find some equilibrium here bemuses me. And it can only be explained by the fact that, that our culture is dominated by very ignorant and cowardly people. Yes. Anyway, we've been chatting for quite a while, and I don't have a cool. I don't have a cool question to ask at the end, like the uh, the trigonometry lads. But uh, the, the, I think they've they've patented the the whole. Uh, what should we be talking about that we aren't talking about? That's just a brilliant killer end of interview question. I'm afraid I don't have one of those, and because you're not a lawyer, I can't I'm never, ask. I'm never prepared for that question. Oh no, nor am I. I've been on twice now, and both times I completely poo footed myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just you. But what I will recommend to uh, Liberty Law Talk listeners is to give War on the West a read. It's a quick read. It's quite a quick read. Lots of footnotes so you can go exploring further, as I did, as I went down the, repar- the Israeli rep- reparations rabbit hole, which was very, very interesting to explore further. And it's also the video recordings for the UK National Conservatism Conference uh, available on YouTube. You can watch them all, including Douglas's talk that he actually gave at a supper. The reason it looks different from all the others is because the supper was held in the Natural History Museum, and so it's a very different looking venue. And apart from that, is there anything else that you'd like to let people know about? Are you working on something else, or are you able to put out a bit of a teaser for our listeners? <laughs> I'm always working on something else. I can never discuss what, simply because I'm very wary of talking myself out on anything that I haven't oh, yet yes. written down. Fair enough. Good lesson for writers. That's a very good lesson for writers. I suppose I'd also point them to I write columns in the Sun, the New York Post, and the Spectator, and various other uh, venues, National Review, and and I also, if people are interested in, as it were, an addendum to the War of the West, uh, I did a set of interviews with academics called Uncancelled History, which is available free on YouTube. Ten oh, interviews with excellent. leading academics on some of the most contested, n- now contested figures in particularly American history, uh, Christopher Columbus, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, uh, and so on. And, and um, it was my great honor to speak with some of the great scholars of our time who are still around who actually know what they're talking about. And uh, so, yes, Uncancelled History is available free on YouTube, and there's 10 episodes. I'm very proud of, of, of the discussions and of the, the wisdom which I was able to, to, to uh, tease out of. It didn't require much teasing, but get gain from these distinguished people I spoke with. So I'd much recommend that, yes. Thank you very, very much. And thank you very much for coming along to talk to us at Liberty Law Talk, our project of Liberty Fund. It's been a great pleasure, Helen. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk. Be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. 